I don't think I have to do a meditation. I mean, the songs that we so uh, sang here. You know, last night I was trying to write down things and put it on my phone. But if you have a 15-week-old cat, you, you know that you can't do that. He erased everything. So I'm going to just do this by this, the faith of God. You know, years ago I was in a bad spot. My life wasn't that good. But you know, God came back to me. I found God again. And I think when we have communion, I want you guys to just think about what God has done for you. Maybe look back at the time that you were baptized, what the feeling was when you were baptized. So as we come today, you know, we break bread, which represents his body. And we take the juice that represents his blood. God died for all of us. We need to remember this, not only on Sundays, but every day of the week. We need to think about it and praise God. Like I say, these songs that we sung today were amazing songs. And I was sitting here thinking, well, I don't have to do nothing. But I just want you guys to really, as we take communion today, think about them things. Um, I'll pray, and they'll come up, and they'll start serving us. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious, gracious Father, we come to you not only just to sit here and worship and praise your name by songs, but we're thankful for what you have done for each and every one of us. As we get ready to take this bread that represents your body, and your juice that represents your blood, Lord, that we will remember every day what you've done for all of us. We've all had things in our life that we went through, and you were there to support us all. So we just ask you to be with each one as they think about what you've done in their lives, that we remember what you did for us. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Let's close this time with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you, creator of heaven and earth, awesome in power and might and glory, dwelling in places and surrounded by things that we can barely imagine and draw into our imagination. And yet despite that, God, you love us. You care for us. You care for those that you've created and created in, in your image. Father, you loved us so much that um, to make a way back to you, you sent Jesus for us. And you encourage us and you challenge us to remember that. So we're thankful for this time of communion. Thankful for Randy sharing with us, God. Thankful for the team that leads us um, to your throne on Sunday morning to worship you and to, and to recognize and acknowledge that you are holy, holy, holy. Father, bless our time now as we open your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. You know what's next? I love it. Makes me wish I was one of them. Before we get started, I want to make a special announcement. Um, there was a baptism here yesterday. Cheyenne Williams. Cheyenne is the, the granddaughter. Yep, yep, yep. Because see, even if you didn't do that, the angels in heaven were. So um, Cheyenne's a granddaughter of Stuart and, and, uh, and Gail Brown. Uh, Cheyenne grew up at Tyler Street Church, and when she decided she wanted to be a follower of Jesus, and they said, well, uh, she wanted to be baptized. Where do you want to be baptized at? It was she wanted to be baptized here, Tyler Street. So there's those strong bonds and ties that to, 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 a, to a large degree that you're responsible for in reaching out to her and, and, and loving, loving her and her family. All right, so we're closing in at the end of our handoff series. So next week, I hear you got something special planned for next week, but then the following week, you, um, Jordan is going to wrap up this handoff series. But I wanted to mention that the series started out simply to prepare the church here for my retirement and for the passing the baton of its next leaders. And we saw the, pres the precedent for, for such preparation when the Apostle Paul was writing to his protege, Timothy, and he tells Timothy, who's probably in Ephesus, he's saying, the things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, I want you to entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also, so in Paul's mind, there was an understanding that there would be a passing on, there would be a handing off, and Paul was going to prepare Timothy, and Timothy was supposed to be preparing other men and women in the church to take that baton, to carry it, and then to pass it on as well. So that was the original intent of the purpose. Uh, that was the original purpose uh, of this series. But as happens so often, when, when we take a little bit of time to linger in the Word of God, we see more and we understand more. So several weeks ago, Jordan shared with us that Jesus, when Jesus was ready to ascend into heaven, he, he gathered he gathered together the apostles and he executed the perfect handoff from himself to imperfect people. See? And it was really important for us to know and understand this, that Jesus handed it off. He gave the perfect handoff to imperfect people. Now, I'm pretty sure that when that happened, some of the followers probably wished they would have had paid more attention. Some of them probably wished that they would have taken notes, you know, if they had known that it was going to be up to them at a certain point. And what's interesting is that we're not surprised, we shouldn't be surprised, when that, that's coming closer and closer, and then we have someone like Thomas, 
Listen to this. Jesus is saying, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. So this is some of that preparation. He's going to be handing the baton off. And, and, and you know the way where I'm going. And Thomas, you know, Thomas raises his hand and said, said uh, uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And, and we don't know the way. Have you felt like that? Have you felt like there's a lot more that you don't know than that you do know when it comes to being a follower of Jesus? So, see, we don't, no, nobody should be painting these guys as, as miracle people, saints. When push came to shove, Thomas had the courage to say, Appreciate it, Lord, but I have no idea what I'm doing here. See, some of you might feel that way. Some of you might. But we do understand from this and from everything else that we read in the scriptures, we understand that we're all in the line for the handoff. All of us. Each of us. Me, you, you're in the line for the handoff. We've been asked to put our hand to the plow and head with a long obedience in the same direction. Each of us has a part. Each of us has a role. Each has a place in building and spreading the good news about the kingdom of heaven. And yeah. Sometimes it seems like a daunting task. Sometimes it's very trying. Sometimes it's very tiring. And then what Ian reminded us of last week is, is don't be discouraged. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't get to that point where you're saying, oh, what's the use? Because there's somebody that needs that baton handed off to them. And God says, we're that person. We've seen churches do the handoff poorly. We've seen churches that didn't do the handoff at all. See? I mean, among our own fellowship, we've seen doors that have been closed. We've seen a sign put over the announcement that says, closed for business. No longer involved in building the kingdom of heaven on earth. Some, some wouldn't let the baton be passed. Some wouldn't accept the baton when it was passed. So when it comes to the handoff, we've seen the bad and the ugly. What we're trying to do here is to see the good, how it's supposed to happen, being transferred from one to another. But there's one more area of the handoff that we have to look at this morning, and that is the handoff that happens at home. I'm going to suggest maybe the most important Handoff. Because the handoff actually started as a family charge. Abraham, you give it to Isaac. Isaac, you give it to Jacob. Jacob, you give it to... And then down through the ages, in the families, the baton was passed. Men and women by no means perfect, okay? By no means perfect, just like the perfect one that handed off to the unperfect ones with Jesus. Men and women by no means perfect, but receiving the promises of God and then accepting the responsibilities that came with it. God was working, God was moving, and they were expected to be a part of it. And, and see, you see, what's amazing 
about these people passing on the baton to their children is that sometimes it happened that they were passing it on to their adult children. See? Sometimes it was from the father to the adult sons and daughters. A father telling their adult children what to focus on, where to go, the blessings and the curses that come along with the baton. So maybe, maybe, the hardest place for the handoff to happen is in the family, around the kitchen table, driving in the car, sitting in the backyard with your family. It's been said, and it's completely true, that God has no grandchildren. You, you, you understand that, right? God has children. God doesn't have grandchildren. He, he has children. And that means every generation has to decide to trust and accept God's invitation, invitation to follow him. Every generation has to wrestle with answering Jesus' question, who do you say I am? I, I know who your mom and dad say. Who do you say that I am? But that next generation, our children, must be given something to help them answer that question. As our children, young and adult, struggle with, is it even worth it to follow God? as they struggle with, is this really what I want to do? We have to give them something. They need somewhere, a safe somewhere, where they can ask those questions without being stonewalled or ignored or given just a, a flippant answer. Completely. And as parents and grandparents, we often feel unprepared and clueless and ill-equipped for the task. And sometimes our approach looks more like that pendulum. You know that pendulum, right? We go from, <laughs> we go from strict and stern, that eh, didn't seem to work. Let's just go to, you'll figure it out. I just want to suggest it. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know and understand. And neither one of those work. You know, because what we've said forever, what we've said for what I've said for 10 years, is that relationships are messy. See? And if you want messy, if you don't like messy, don't be involved with people. Your people are messy. Our children, if they're going to take the baton and run with it, we have to give them something worth grabbing and holding on to. Something deemed more valuable, something seen as more important than what the world might offer them. Because, you know, it's this deal of, hmm, hmm, this looks good. Why wouldn't I do that? This doesn't look so good. Why would I do that? We have to give them something important enough to make the tough decisions in life, you guys. Because as you already know, life has just lots and lots and lots of really important decisions. Really important decisions. We have to give them something to help them make the tough decision. You know, like Moses had to make. It says by Moses, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You remember the story, right? Pharaoh said, uh, I'm sick and tired of, of these Hebrew babies. They're getting too many, too many. All the boys, you got to kill the boys. And so Moses' mother wasn't down with that. 
put the little guy in a basket and just kind of guided the basket in the Nile towards Pharaoh's daughter where she would be bathing. And so Moses grew up being the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, choosing, rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin. If we expect our children to take the baton and to run with it with the view of eventually passing it on to someone else, we have to give them something that's more important and, what, and more valuable than what the world is offering them. Something that will allow them to make the tough choices in life Something important enough that they see you making those tough choices in life. Something important enough and valuable enough that they see you modeling it for them and adopting a lifestyle that says, oh no, this is important. We could do other stuff, we could have other stuff, we could pursue it, but this, this, my beloved, is important. So this is what we're going to do. And and you would expect that if that's what's happening, when they get to that important decision part, they're they're going to say, yeah, I'm going to choose this rather than that. You see, Moses got that conviction not from Pharaoh's daughter. Moses got that conviction from his real home, from his real parents. And we have no idea what mom and dad told Moses. But when push came to shove, Moses chose to endure ill treatment with the people of God. Instead of being the son of Pharaoh's daughter, which I suppose eventually would have put him in the place of being Pharaoh of Egypt. See? But he didn't come to that conclusion because of what he learned in Pharaoh's home. He learned that what he, he, he got to that point from what he learned in his real home, from his real parents. With what we say and with what we do, we need to give our kids a reason to love Jesus with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul. So if forgiveness is one of the reasons for loving God, if forgiveness is for you, let your kids see that at home. Let your children see how forgiveness works, not just between you and them, but between you and other people. Let let them see what you do when you're wronged and how you respond to that. See, let them see you do wrong and then how you respond to that in both giving and receiving forgiveness. I mean, if that's a reason for loving God, let them see it at home. If if getting a second chance at life is a reason to follow Jesus. Let your kids see that at home, man. Let them see what that looks like. I mean, tell them. I mean, if you feel like you got a second chance in life, tell them. And then when they screw up, let them see what it really looks like. See? See? Not just to be forgiven, but to have a second chance at life. When our kids were young, were young. One Christmas, we had a great idea that we were going to give these kids what we called grace notes. So we had a little, you know, piece of paper, and all around the border, we wrote grace, 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 grace. And then in the middle, I think we had some scripture, honey. I think we had some scripture. Oh, no, we had an explanation. Oh, oh, this was the good part. We had an explanation. 
This is a grace card. If you mess up, you give mom and dad the grace card. Now, I know, I know. It's, I mean, I told you we were young, right? We, we were young. We didn't know any better. And, and just so that I don't bore you or take all the time, the, the kids did mess up, and they, they pulled the grace card on us. Now, you want to be between a rock and a hard spot. Put yourself in the place where your kid has just messed up and they deserve to be punished. And then they say, oh, oh, is this good here, Dad? Is, did, I mean, did you mean this, Dad? Is this, is this? So if a second chance at life is one of the reasons you're following, you, let them see it at home. Um, if, if God's love never failing is a reason for you to get up and keep trying. Let them experience it at home. Doesn't mean you're not disappointed. Doesn't mean it doesn't mean a lot of things. It just means that love, God would tell us, love never fails. You see, that's what we count on in our life. God's love never failing. So if it's a reason for following. God, if it's a reason to, to take that baton, and then if it's a reason to pass, let your children see it at home. Because it is the home that's the first place of learning the great value and blessings of knowing Jesus and of learning to love the things of God and to love God. And as grandparents, grandparents, please, Use your influence and resources for more than spoiling your sweet little grandchildren. You know. Pass on what you passed on to your children. Pass that on to your grandchildren. Here's how Moses would say it. Moses would say, only be very careful for yourself and watch over your soul diligently so that you don't forget these things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. But make them known to your sons and your grandsons. See, some people are under that. <laughs> I'm amazed. Some people are under the false uh, uh, understanding that once your kids become adults and move away, that you're free, free at last. Thank God I'm free at last. It's like, man, no. It's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. It'll probably get worse before it gets better. I mean, you know, I'm just trying to be honest, you guys. You know, I, I see, I see, I see parents with young children, and they're beside themselves. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, oh. wait ten more years. <laughs> right now, you know, you're dealing with they won't, they won't pick up their toys, or they won't eat their vegetables. See, oh, oh, when they're 15, 16, 17, 18, oh, please, God, give me those problems, <laughs> right? You'll be saying that, Brad. I guarantee, I guarantee, I guarantee it. And it, and it's only because, you know, your children are trying to, they're trying to figure out this this faith for themselves. See, and and both of you are trying to figure this out together how to do that. Um, but but see what happens too often. Too often we see in families what we see in our churches, and that is that the handoff is done poorly. Or, or not at all. You know, we see parents unwilling to be in the race and to take the baton. Or we see children unwilling to grab the baton when passed on to them. Now, here's a big deal, okay? Um, because y y you think you know where I'm going and I'm not going there. So I'll tell you I'm not going there. The goal here is not to invoke guilt. All right? You guys have plenty of that on your own without me adding to it, right? You, you, you do. So the, the purpose of a lesson like this is not to invoke, induce, or promote, or encourage guilt. The goal, the goal is to give us, to give me, and to give you a valid reason for doing something different than we've done. You got that? I mean, that's why. 
It's, okay, maybe I need to do something different if I want a different end to it. The goal is to have valid reasons for not giving up. The goal is to have valid reasons for not growing weary. Because, let, let me make, well, I was going to make a point, but I'm going to, we sing a song sometimes. And uh, part of the chorus of the song is, Nothing is better than you. No, nothing is better than you. You know that song, right? Talking about Jesus, right? See, that's the point, you guys. Nothing is better than Jesus. Nothing. See, no one, no one loves you as much as Jesus loves you. No one cares for you as much as, care, as Jesus cares. No one has done as much for you as Jesus has done for you and for me. See, that's what we want in our homes. And I know there's no manual that comes with your little one that says, here's how to make that happen. It just has to be learned and modeled, and then it can be passed on. Because most of us know that as young families, we start strong. That's kind of the pendulum on this way. You know. Stern and strict. and You're going to love Jesus because I say so. See? And then we go here. But most families start strong. Our great desire is to have these young ones grow strong in the faith and learn to love Jesus with all their hearts. But then something happens. Something happens along the way. I mean, you know, there, there are bills to pay and there are schedules to keep and life gets busy. I mean, it gets really busy. And to the point, sometimes even going to church and spending time with other Christians becomes hard to fit into the schedule. See? And in this process of life, one of the things that unfortunately happens is that our children start learning what's really important to us. I mean, they hear us say something is important, and then they see us living something a little bit different. And, and they start seeing the place that God and faith and helping people learn about God really plays in, in our life. But not only does the handoff and our families become difficult. But the relationship with our children can become strained and even damaged. And so talking about anything is hard, let alone talking about faith and Jesus. Are you with me here? It's not just that handing off the baton becomes difficult. It's that the relationship itself is strained. Forget the baton. They don't want to talk to me. I don't want to talk to them. No. We have four wonderful children. And I'm, I think we have a really good relationship with all four of our children. But that's not always been the case. There have been times when one of them said, I'm out of here. And I said, good. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. See? Because you know what it's like. You're just, you've had it. They wear you out. They wear you down. And it's like, <laughs> the big problem is not talking about Jesus anymore. The big problem is just talking. See? So thankfully... Thankfully, went to a counselor, probably Smee's suggestion, like I said, okay, you don't want to be here. I don't want you to be here. Went to a counselor, and the counselor said, look, stupid. <laughs> Counselors don't say that. I, I will tell you, they think that. He said, look, guys, if you ever expect to have a relationship with your children, Somebody has to be the adult. Somebody 
has to be the adult. Somebody has to be the one that won't burn the bridge. Somebody has to be the one that that keeps the door open through the horribly awkward, difficult time. We still have issues with our kids. Not issues, differences. We have spiritual differences. We have political differences. We have cultural differences. We have um, an understanding on a host of things different than we do. But what me and I are learning, trying to learn, is to not burn the bridges and not sever the relationship. Somebody has to be the adult. And I'm sad to say that we talk with people that sometimes it's up to the children to be the adult. Don't let that be. Don't let it be that. Please, please. We've learned, me and I have learned, that things change. And that people change. I change. See? See? And at the end of the day, we want to be in a position where we can exercise love towards one another. And as much as possible, we're learning to listen to each other and extend grace to each other. So again, in the home and within the family, it ought to be the place where we're constantly trying to let God shape us into the people that can pass on and receive the baton of the good news of the kingdom of God. Another disclaimer. Adam and Eve had the perfect parent. Right? Adam and Eve had the perfect parent, God. And Adam and Eve made poor choices. So, please, please, listen to this, okay? Our children's poor choices are not necessarily a reflection of your poor parenting. All right? We understand that. That's not the purpose. Okay? We don't need our parents' help to make bad choices. We can do that on our own quite well. Thank you very much. All of you, I have proven that. But there are things that we can do to give them a chance. Just to give them a chance at grabbing the baton. Let's look at a couple of these. Let them hear you tell of what God has done and can do. This isn't glorying in your sordid past. No. You know, there are some things that you, you, there aren't going to be appropriate to share with your children. But what you can share is what God has done and can do for you and, and for them. This is what the psalmist would say. One generation will praise your works to another and will declare your mighty acts. That's, pardon me, that's just part of the handoff. Part of the handoff is just not telling the kids the do's and don'ts. Part of the handoff is is declaring God's praise and His mighty works from one generation to another. You know, and some families have different ways to do that. At Thanksgiving time, they'll go around and let everybody say what they're thankful for. Or, or at birthday time, you know, the whole family will just say what they're thankful for that God has done for this or that. But, you, I mean, you're just going to have to figure out how to, how to get this done. You know, around the dining room table. Or when you're driving in the car, when you're in the backyard, just to be able to declare what God is doing and what God, what God has done. So see, that's just something we can do just to give them a reason and to establish what's important. Or or we could do this, we could say this. Make God and his purposes just a natural part of family life. Just a natural part. And and you know know what we're going to read now, Deuteronomy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words, which I'm commanding you today, shall be on your heart. And you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and daughters, and you shall speak of them. Look, 
when you sit down, when you walk by the road, when you lie down, when you get up. If you haven't figured it out, that's all the time. That's all the time, you know. You shall tie them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as front as on your forehead. You shall also put them on your refrigerators. He didn't say that, but that's what he meant. I know, I hate refrigerator magnets. But if they say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, I'm saying, go for it. Well, God's just helping us understand is that if we're, going to, if we're going to help our children to want this baton and to be willing to take it, we have to give them a reason, a reason that it's more valuable and more important than what the world is offering them. We can just tell our children what God has done for us. And we can make God just a part, a natural, natural part of our family life. Home ought to be a place. This is important, and we're wrapping up with this. Home is a place where God should be the most real and best known. It might not be this way at church. I mean, it might not be. At home, it ought to be. Home ought to be the place where God is the most real and the best known. It ought to be that place where God is remembered. It ought to be that place where God is praised for His goodness. It ought to be that place where God is called upon for help. It ought to be that place where God has a place at the table, in the kitchen, and a chair in the living room. It just ought to be that place. Naturally, as just a part of life. If God has bless you with children and grandchildren. Don't squander or waste the opportunity God has given you. Don't let excuses of awkwardness or not knowing all the answers stop you from engaging in the most important conversation that you could ever have. I know it can be difficult. I know it can be difficult. But a good handoff to the next generation depends on giving it your best effort. You know. And just like in Jesus taking these 11 and giving it to them and saying, go, there was no plan B. There was no plan B. If they didn't do their job, the death of Jesus was in vain. They did their job. They've passed the baton. And now, at this point, many of you have that baton. We want to encourage you to run with it, like Patrick told us. We want to encourage you to not grow weary, like Ian encouraged us. We want to encourage you that you don't have to be perfect, like Jordan reminded us. But we have to be able to pass it on to our children. Let's be standing and we'll close with a word of prayer. Pray with me. Our Father, again, we just bow before you. We bow before all that you are, all that you've done, all that you will do. And God, we do acknowledge and we confess that some of these things that you call us to are hard. Some are difficult. Um, some we just feel as helpless and clueless as can be. And yet we've come to trust you, Father, that you won't abandon us, you won't forsake us, you won't put anything in our way that we can't handle and that we can't deal with, and we are eternally thankful for that particular promise, God. And so here, on behalf of the whole Tyler Street Church, I ask you to help us, help us intentionally, conscientiously, and with our best effort, make our homes a place where the passing of the baton can be easier and more readily done in light of what 
the world is calling our children and even us too, Father. Help us to encourage one another in this. Help us never to approach this as a reason for, for inducing or promoting guilt, but always to encourage and to build up. Father, I pray for the children here at Tyler Street. God, I pray that you would bless their time here when we're, when we're together as a congregation, that their experience here is good and healthy, that they see people that love them, the people that pay attention to them and deal with them as, as important and valuable. I pray that you'd bless the, those that are teaching our children, Father. I pray for those that are teaching our older um, young adults, God, that they'd see something, they'd see the importance and the value of what you've done for us and what you call us to. God, help us to be in this together. Help this handoff to be something that's joyous and joyful. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm um, just a couple things, guys.